Good afternoon. Hi. <laughs> This, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to do this and to, to share with, uh, with you all some of my thoughts and sort of leading up to uh, the work that has been most recently in my mind, which is the adaptation that uh, I, have, I did of Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace. So I thought I would spend some time with, uh, with you guys today sort of talking about adaptation, thinking about adaptation and what exactly that means because we are surrounded by it. It is everywhere. And there are some reasons for that, which I'll delve into, but also uh, sort of doing that, hopefully within the, the timeline of my own journey with this particular piece and with this particular author, who is one of my favorites. So hopefully you guys are familiar with, uh, with the book. I'll give you a little bit of a capsule. But uh, Margaret Atwood um, has been in the cultural conversation of late for a number of reasons. And this particular intersection with her sort of came about because uh, my, uh, as a playwright, I'm interested in, in various things. And one of them is I'm obsessed with large questions. Another one is I am fascinated by issues of science and technology. Large questions, issues of science and technology are very much undercurrents in this particular book, but also in her work in general. Um, I also joke with my students a lot in the first week of my playwriting class, and I say playwrights are um, terrible people because we love to create really nice people and then put them into horrible situations, and then they have to figure it out, right? And this is one of the reasons why we love drama and we are so attracted to stories and storytelling, and there is a ton of research, and, and Atwood herself has actually participated in some of this, that suggests that stories are why we are who we are today as a species, that it is an adaptation, adaptation, uh, an, an evolutionary adaptation. And because we understand narrative theory in a biological way, that gave us a survival advantage that then allowed us to, to develop as a species in the world. So we've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years, right? Maybe it's about uh, uh, a really nice person who happened to go across a river uh, to find food and got eaten by a crocodile on the way, right? So we're gonna tell the story of that person who was a very nice person but happened to get eaten by a crocodile so that we don't go over there and get eaten by crocodiles too, right? Yeah, all right. The other thing that I love to do, and this has been a part of the cultural conversation lately too, is I am obsessed with this idea of the female protagonist and what does this mean, right? Because throughout history, we have no problem with Hamlet being a jerk right? Oedipus made really bad decisions, right? And we give him the benefit of the doubt, but for some reason, when you move a woman into the role of the protagonist, right, we get really judgy, right? At first, we don't want to see women make mistakes. We don't want to see women in the position, in Atwood's case, in this particular book's case, of the murderess, right? Of the person who is not disclosing her heart and soul and the truth of the matter, and I'll get to that in a second, but these are things I love to do. So accordingly, then, I'm pretty obsessed with Atwood, and I have been for a while, um, and I am going to, to pepper my discussion with some quotes by her. Uh, some of them are not very nice. This is, really isn't a very nice quote, but it's, if you're a woman writer, sometimes, somewhere, you will be asked, do you think of yourself as a writer first or as a woman first? And I have been asked this question. I have been asked this question at more than one conference and it, by, by well-meaning people, right? As though I have a choice, right? As though I have a choice to be a woman in this moment and to be a writer in that. And of course, she goes on to say, whoever ha asks this hates and fears both writing and women. I don't know if I would go that far, but that is certainly something to think about. So in her case, obviously, she, has, she is a part of our conversation right now, most uh, specifically, because of the uh, Emmy Award winning, multiple Emmy Award winning Hulu adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, how many of you have seen that? Oh, a few of you, maybe half of you. I would strongly recommend it, but it's really hard. It is really, really difficult to watch that right now for a number of reasons. And I could give you a whole hour long presentation on that, but I won't do that because we're talking about Alias Grace. But um, because of that, her work, the bulk of which, happened in the, the 80s and 90s, right? She put out novel after novel after novel in that sort of, sort of two-decade span. 
um, is, is really relevant now. It's sort of scarily relevant now, right? And so it's finding a new cultural conversation um, which was uh, things that, that she was thinking about those decades earlier are kind of coming to pass, right, in very, in very specific ways. And Alias Grace uh, was also a Netflix miniseries as well, and I'll tell you sort of some of the specifics of how that whole thing came about. One of my favorite uh, passages from the book, it's actually not in the play, but this was something that drove my process as I was working on this adaptation. Um, when you are in the middle of a story, it isn't a story at all, but only a confusion, a dark roaring, a blindness, a wreckage of shattered glass and splintered wood, like a house in a whirlwind, or else a boat crushed by the icebergs and swept over the rapids. I love her language. All and all aboard are powerless to stop it. It's only afterwards that it becomes anything like a story at all when you're telling it to yourself or to someone else. She talks a lot about stories being a metaphor for life, right? So that when we are in the story, we don't know that we're in a story and we don't put the structure on our experiences. It is chaotic, it is a mess, right? Only afterwards do we think about things in terms of the structure and what we learned and what came out of that, right? And she has a, a very uh, famous thing that is attributed to her uh, which is actually from Handmaid's Tale, which is, in the end, we are all stories, right? So, uh, it is, uh, any, how many of you have read it or are familiar with it? Okay, I'll give you a little, just, just what you need to know, because we're not going to talk so much about the content of it as much as the process and the conversation between the two works. But it was written in 1996, it's historical fiction, and it's based on a true story. But she created this piece of fiction as a way of filling in some massive holes in this true story, right? So Grace Marks is sort of described as Canada's Lizzie Borden, right? She was 16 years old when she committed some pretty horrific murders. But um, she was actually released after about 20 years in prison. They're not exactly sure why, but they think that she might have been proven innocent. And there's really not a whole lot of evidence one way or the other about whether or not she did it. And there are conflicting stories in the public record. So what Atwood did was take these conflicting stories and try and weave them together into some possibilities. And in doing so, the book itself actually explores the notion of truth. How can we know what happened? Do we know what happened? And who gives us that lens to view the truth? Obviously, this is something that is very, very prevalent to us right now as we sort of think about our current cultural moment. Um, my story with this novel is kind of interesting because I had, as, uh, as some uh, women had done, it was actually banned in my high school. Um, and because it was banned in my high school, I went to find it and I read it <laughs> when I was 17. Uh, which is The Handmaid's Tale. So that was the first Atwood book that I, that I read, and I sort of fell in love with it. I was like, oh my God, this is great, right? But I didn't know why it was great until I uh, uh, fast forward to, after I graduate from college, I get a job at a bookstore. So I am a bookseller at Borders Books and Music, may they rest in peace, and uh, was having a wonderful time in my early 20s just being surrounded by books. And uh, The Robber Bride, one of her novels, and that hit the bestseller list, and we had this amazing thing that we could do at Borders. We could check out books, right? So if it was a hardcover book, all we had to do was turn in the dust jacket so that remained pristine and we could take a book home and read it for a few days and then bring it back because they wanted us to be knowledgeable about what we were doing. So as soon as that came out, I was like, oh, Atwood, I really like The Handmaid's Tale. So I took The Robber Bride home and that is a great book. It is not speculative fiction or historical fiction. It's actually kind of a snark fest in a weird way. It's sort of like Real Housewives of New England and it's four different stories of a woman who had an affair with all of these men, right? And it still talks about intersections of women's agency and the truth and all of that. So it was a lovely, uh, I, I spent a lovely weekend with this book and had the time of my life. So I brought it back. And so that got me to revisit The Handmaid's Tale, which maybe six years later, it took on even more significance because rather than being a high school student, now I am a woman in my early 20s trying to navigate my way in a world that was not really made for me, right? So I, I got more from it at that point in time, which, which really, again, sort of turned me on to it. So I graduated with a theater degree, and uh, the, the short version is that I tried writing plays when I was an undergrad. Uh, I was marginally successful, 
And then I decided to write my first full-length play uh, when I was 20 years old, and it was horrible. It was really, really, it was like vomit-worthy. It was so bad. And I'm sitting in the back of the room during a reading of this thinking, why did I ever think I could be a writer? This is awful. Not only was the play awful, but the experience was awful. <laughs> I thought I would never wanted to do this again. So at the same time, I discovered directing for the theater. And uh, it, was, it was during that time that uh, I had decided that I was going to be a director. So sold a bunch of stuff, threw the rest in a rental car, rental van, moved up to Chicago, moved in with a friend, and spent most of my 20s just making theater on a shoestring. And I was directing a lot, and it was amazing. And I had uh, uh, just this great time. And then at the meantime, I had transferred up to the borders on Michigan Avenue. So now I was surrounded by four floors of books, which was even better, right? So it was a great way to spend my early 20s. Um, as I was at the bookstore, opened up a box, alias Grace, right? This was before the internet, so I didn't know it was coming, right? And it was a box full of Margaret Atwood, and I was really excited. So put it up on the shelves, and then my manager let me take it home. And uh, I started reading it that day, and I stayed up all night for, uh, for two days. I just read, read, and read, and read, and read. And it just had this effect on me, and it was beautiful. And I remember thinking this. I want to direct this play. That's what I remember thinking. Because there was an amazing intimacy between these two characters, and I could see it in my head, right? And it was, you know, this sort of lovely relationship, this fraught relationship that was sort of surrounded by these scenes of people moving in and out. And I was like, this really needs to be a play. And that kind of stuck with me, right? So now we're going to fast forward many, many years. <laughs> and here I am at Ball State University. And I am uh, teaching in the Department of Theater and Dance. And there's a gentleman whose name is Brian Nitzkin. And he is a producer. He is a theater producer slash film producer. He lives in LA, but he works on both coasts. And he happens to be friends with Bill Jenkins, who's the chair of the theater department. They went to the school together. And this is the way things work in our business. We meet people who know people. And we talk to people about our hopes and dreams. And if you are sincere, as Linus in the pumpkin patch, right? If you are surrounded by sincerity, then you make friends and you make allies. And if you want to tell stories and if you are excited about it, then people around you get excited about it too and they want to jump on the train. So Brian came to visit and he was talking to our students about what it means to be a producer. And he asked Bill if he could sit in, in some classes, if he could sit through some classes while he was here. And so he sat through my playwriting class. And at the end of the class, he came up to me. And luckily, I didn't have a class after that. And so we went to go get a cup of coffee. And he was talking to me about just some of the things that came up in the class. And we had a lovely conversation. And then at the end of it, he agreed to read one of my plays. And then he asked me if there was any IP, intellectual property, that I was interested in adapting. And I thought that was an odd question, but you know, I had you know, just made a connection with this great person. So without hesitating, without hesitating, I said, alias Grace. And he's like, why alias Grace? And I went into this thing that I just told you about, right, which was my connection to the novel and what I thought when I first read it. And, and he goes, well, great. That sounds like it might be fun. And I was like, sure, why not? Yay, right? So we said, we'll keep in touch. We'll keep the conversation going, quote, 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 right, which is what you say in the industry, <laughs> and uh, went about our separate ways. So a few months later, um, at that point, I have uh, two toddlers, uh, one that loved to run around the house naked uh, before bath. So we were getting ready for bath time. And I will never forget this, because the television was on. Um, and we had just gotten this call waiting thing, right? So the phone would ring and the number would pop up. And I was chasing my daughter around trying to put a towel around her after bath. And she was wet and she was naked and she was laughing and it was funny, but I didn't have time. I was worried she was going to fall. So I was freaking out. The phone rings. It's chaos at my house. I glance up at the phone and it says it's Los Angeles. And I'm like, I don't know anybody in Los Angeles. So I wasn't going to get the phone. And David took the towel from me, and he goes, get the phone. Got the phone. It was Brian Nitzkin. And I, I said, how did you get this number? And he goes, it was on the play you sent me. I'm like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so he asked me if I was still interested in the Atwood Project. And I was like, what does that mean? 
And he goes, well, I got you the rights. He said, I really, really enjoyed our conversation, and I think you have a really interesting take on the novel. I had read it when it came out. I reread it. I called Margaret. You have the rights for the next four years. And my next question was, I don't have any money to pay you. <laughs> what do I do about that? And he goes, no, this is fine. This is what I do, right? This is what producers do. So then um, I, I had to do it. So all of a sudden, now I'm on the hook for this thing I thought would be a good idea. Right, what's that? I got four years. Yeah, so it's this thing that was like, I thought it would be a good idea. Maybe this is a really bad idea. Who knows? So I began thinking about, I had not adapted anything before. I'd done a sort of fugue on the yellow wallpaper, which was this thing, but that's public domain. You can do whatever the heck you want with it, right? This is something different. So I started thinking about what it means to adapt, right? Comes from the Latin to fit. This is a dictionary definition, of course. You know, it's the first thing you do. <laughs> All right, what does it mean? Look it up, right? To make something suitable for a new purpose, to modify, to become adjusted to new conditions. And of course, this is the one that is appropriate, which is to alter the text to make it suitable for filming, broadcasting, or the stage. All right, here we go. So there's a, there's a precedent, obviously. And I also knew that Hollywood, there's nothing new in Hollywood, right? We've all seen that so many of the movies that come out are adaptations of books, adaptations now of comic books, graphic novels, right? All this stuff is happening. So, of course, you know, there has to be some sort of a science or a reasoning to it. So I jumped in, right? I jumped in, and I, I, I write it. And it's a 512-page novel. It has two unreliable narrators, and it's told from two very different perspectives. Grace's part of the book is this sort of beautiful, poetic, kind of internal monologue. And the psychiatrist's part of the book is this really cold, sort of third person telling of what's going on. And I'm, you know, I'm just having a ball, right? I'm kind of playing around in these weird spaces and it's, it's really fun. And, and this happened, this is what it looked like, <laughs> right? So I've got the date down there, right? It's full length play. And you'll notice up at the top it's 144 pages. That's actually kind of stupid for a stage play, just letting you know. So after this, right, uh, we, Brian and I cook up this thing uh, that has since become a thing here at Ball State, which is really cool, is we were going to do a reading of it. So we brought in some actors from out of town to read some of the older roles, and we brought in a bunch of students. And uh, Brian came in, and then a playwright friend of our department, uh, John Cariani, who's an actor and a playwright, um, wrote a play called Almost Maine that was a huge hit. He came in, and we did this big event around the reading, and we did a couple of other plays that were being written by faculty, and it turned into this glorious thing. And um, so Brian decided he wanted to do a reading of this play. And uh, the first reading, was almost four hours long. <laughs> we scheduled it for two, and there were 24 people on stage. <laughs> so if you can imagine, like, if we were to do it in this room, the actors would be, like, all around the front, and nobody could, know who, nobody could tell who was who, nobody knew what was going on. Some things were funny, other things were ridiculously long, and I had a flashback to that awful moment in college when I wrote this full length play and I felt like I wanted to throw up, right? So three hours into this, I'm like, it's never gonna end. Oh my God, please make it end. I just wanna leave, I just wanna go somewhere. And uh, it was really, it was, it was uh, interesting. I mean, I was sort of like this emotional, um, uh, sort of like an open wound, <laughs> if you will, right? So we did a feedback session afterwards with John and Brian, and they were very, uh, they were, uh, very gracious. And uh, then, uh, then this happened. I'm like, <laughs> I can't do this. What am I doing? Oh my god, I put in all this work to this thing that is just not going to work, right? 512 pages, so much stuff, right, in this beautiful book, and I totally messed it up. Right, so uh, I kind of dealt with it and I felt like this, right? You dangle on the leash of your own longing, your need grows teeth, right? I love this line. Um, and this is how I felt. I needed something. I didn't know what. I, I, I was obsessed with the story and I loved it and I hated it, right? 
So I was in this horrible kind of dark space with this project. So I had this feedback session, and here I was, right? So I did all of this work. It's not working. I don't know what this is. What's next, right? Well, luckily, Brian called me. And he goes, how you doing? <laughs> and I said, I, I was apologetic. And I sort of fell into this, uh, you guys know what a, imposter syndrome is, right? I was sort of in this worst place of imposter syndrome. And I, I apologized. I said, I am so sorry. You put all of these financial resources and this faith in me, and this is what I came up with. And he's like, what are you talking about? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to curse. Can I curse for a moment? Sure. Okay. He said, that's your shitty first draft. Yeah. So that comes from Anne Lamott, who is an amazing writer. And if you like to write, you should read a book called Bird by Bird, right? Because one of the things she talks about is the shitty first draft, which is where you work through everything you want to work through with the piece. And at the end of that phone call, Brian told me these words. You are a playwright. Now go write a play. I'm like, okay. So I began thinking about adaptation again, right? And why we are drawn to it, right? And, and I have some, some of my own thoughts about this, which I will share. And one of them comes from this notion. There's this book um, by George Pulte. came out, I think it was 27. I should have checked. I'm sorry. This is a lecture. I should know these things. It's called The 36 Dramatic Situations. Look it up. That'll tell you when it was written. But the, the, uh, the theory behind this book is that there are only, in the entire world, 36 dramatic situations, meaning there are 36 possible plots that you can point to as something that is apocryphal or something that gets sort of passed on, right? And so because of that, we hear the same stories over and over again. They're just in different packages. Maybe they have different characters. Maybe they are in a different location, different time period, right? So all of the variables that are brought into the storytelling shift, but the story itself is one of these 36 situations, right? So perhaps that is a reason why we're OK with adaptations. Perhaps that's a reason why we love to see these stories that we know, for whatever reason, told in different forms. Right? Because as, as storytellers and creators, we talk a lot, we think a lot about the relationship between form and content. Right? Oftentimes, when you get your story, it will tell you what it's supposed to be. Is it a poem? Is it a film? Is it a play? Right? But in this case, the content is already given to us. right? And we're going to translate something from this to this, right? So what is even the point of doing it? Now, the, Hollywood will tell you that the point of doing an adaptation is dollars and cents, basically. That what you have is this original thing. It is already a known commodity, right? It obviously works as a story because it was published. And hopefully, the publisher knows what they're doing, right? So they're going to say, yeah, this is cool. Here you go, stamp of approval, right? It hopefully has interesting characters who do and say interesting things. So that work has already been done for you, right? And then it already has a built-in audience, right? People who love the book will come and see your adaptation, right? Because they want to see what you'll do with it. They want to see where you're going to be clever, where you might make changes or do different things. And then, and this is true of things like Hunger Games, right? We've seen this happen. The title, author, characters, and or world that is created as a part of this piece may already have a built-in audience, right? So we've seen this sometimes with things like Wizard of Oz, right? Where you have this sort of built-in world that's already been created by this book, and then somebody will take it and do something new with it in a different format, right? So this is why Hollywood loves adaptations. And I would add this into the mix as well, is that the original provoked a response in you. And this was my story with Alias Grace, right? When I first read it, the original provoked a very clear, visceral response in me that made me want to stay up all night and that made me want to share this story with other people. Oh my god, you've got to read this book. You've got to read this book. Well, not everybody's going to go off and read the book, right? So maybe if I make a play, people who like to come and see plays will see the book on stage, right? And they will love the story as much as I do. But none of this, which is what Hollywood relies on, Right? 
none of this means that it's a good thing to do, right? How many of you have seen really bad adaptations of things you love, <laughs> right? This is the reason why sometimes they aren't meant to translate from one thing to the other. And this is where I was stuck, right? After I had this experience with this really bad reading, I'm like, oh my God, all right, so I started down a feudal road. Everything I love about this book cannot be brought to the stage, right? Now, people who I knew and trusted around me said, don't give up, right? And that was Brian. He said, you're a playwright, go write a play. So I'm like, all right, you know what? I have absolutely nothing to lose because my next experiment will be in my computer and if it's bad, I can just delete it, right? So I went to a, 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 a book that I had been aware of and hadn't uh, read. A friend of mine had told me about it. I was stuck in this thing called the fidelity model. I was trying to be very true to the original. And to go back to that original definition of adaptation, I was trying to squeeze it into a new form. I was trying to make it fit, right? I was trying to twist it and turn it and, and make it sort of work within these new parameters. All right, that's one way of doing it. And the interesting thing is in Linda Hutchins' book, which if you are interested, and I already talked about this, like, why me, right? Why am I doing this to this book that I love, right? Um, but Linda Hutchins' book, A Theory of Adaptation, is really interesting if you are interested in this, right? Because she tries to break us out of the fidelity model. She tries to get us to think about the actual act and process of the adaptation as a thing itself, right? I've used this term translate in this discussion a lot, but she doesn't like that term, right? She is more about understanding what it is. So it's an acknowledged transposition of an original work. However, it is also, this is a part of her definition of adaptation, it's also a creative and interpretive act of both appropriation and salvaging. So you acknowledge the fact that you are in fact appropriating this original work, right? And this is why we have to ask for permission, right? So we've asked for permission. We have the permission, which I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, I need to allow myself this space to be creative and to interpret. And then this is one of the ones I love, right? This idea of it's an extended intertextual engagement with the adapted work. Right? So I have a visual here in a minute that I'll, ex I'll show you in a second of what that feels like to me. Right? And this is also something that really hit me. It's a palimpsestic, I think I said that right. You know, a palimpsest is, is like something that has been written and then erased, but the original impression of what's been written is still there. Right? So to think about this in a beautiful visual way, right? you have a scroll, something's been written on it, somebody else has come along and erased it and written something else over it, but you still have the impressions of the original thing, right? which I, I just love that idea because it means it's still there. So she also suggests looking at the text with sort of a double vision, right? and then answering the questions of who and why in a very fundamental way. So I, re I read this book and I'm like, all right, so here we go, my experiment with this. And let's see what happens. Okay, so this is my process. <laughs> I always do this, right? So I start someplace, simple, simple, and then it gets really complicated and crazy, and then I go back and loop, 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 right? And then I eventually get to something, so this happened. And then um, I have a whole other discussion we could do on the hero's journey, what I won't. But this is something that is very, very uh, dear to me as I work on my stuff, as I begin to do what's called breaking stories. So if I write an original play, I think about it in terms of this. I don't stop there, but this helps me start, right? And these are things that I did. So I went through this process of really analyzing the text. I broke down the book as I would break down a, normal, a, a, a play and say, what happens? Who does it happen to? Why does it happen? And why does it happen to these people in, in, in particular? And then I'm asking myself, what is the original text about, right? So I do an analysis like I, do, like I would ask my students to do, right? And then I take that information from the analysis and then I do it backwards, <laughs> right? So I've got my journey and I'm going this way and I take that information and I create something new. What happens? Who does it happen to? Why does it happen? Why does it happen to these people in particular? And this can be different. 
can be inspired by, the, by, by what the book is about and what the needs of that particular narrative are, but it's okay to shift this, right? So I allowed myself to think about this as a new thing, right? I was building a play from scratch with this information. And then the structure needs ad uh, advantages and limitations of the new genre, in this case, theater, right? So then I had to ask myself the question of what is this new text about? And then this is also something, and as I said, you know, I could talk about female protagonists, but uh, this is also something I do with my works, right? So I take the normal, quote unquote normal, it's not normal, it's just what we do, hero's journey, right? Very linear, sort of, you know, leading up to a climax. And then I put it in the context of what is the heroine's journey, right? Which is a lot of fun. There's a great book by Maureen Murdoch that talks about sort of the cyclical aspect of women's stories, which is very different from the linear aspect of men's stories, right? So I like to combine the two. I like to collide that. And then I built, you know, I started going more, this is the hero's journey, right? And then I started doing this like you do as a feminist, right? And then that happened. <laughs> again, there was an explosion, but you couldn't hear it. Um, that happened again. And then from the ashes of all of this stuff, as I do with any play, then this happened, right? Now, it's only two pages less, but, but, but there are way fewer characters. This one only has 10, right? So from this, uh, we got Margaret's blessing, like actual blessing on the work of the text itself. And what she told me through Brian is, she said, I've told my story, now you tell yours. And this is the way she feels about people who do adaptations of her work. So what I was doing was right. I was on the right track. And not only that, but the original author actually said of my combination of four of the characters into one person, she said, wow, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> my hero signed off on what I was doing, right? It really doesn't get any better than that. So we went into the idea that we were going to workshop this as a production at Ball State. And that is our rehearsal draft, right, that we started with, which is really exciting. Now, you can't see it over here, but there are actually now only eight characters. <sighs> I'm getting better. And notice it's 135 pages, right? And this is before the other thing that happened. So wait, hold on. We went into rehearsal. We took that draft into rehearsal, and then that happened again. <laughs> And this one, I should have used the other explosion because that one looked like there were papers everywhere. Um, what we realized is when we, we had staged it and we all got in the room together and I'm watching this and I go to the director and I'm like, this is really boring. And she says, yeah, I know, what do we do, right? So I took all of the scenes and put them on index cards and I laid them out on the floor of AC 217, if you've ever been in that room, it's beautiful. Not AC, I'm sorry, um, AR 217, that sort of beautiful rehearsal hall. I was in there for a thing, and there were a couple of hours that were free, so I had these index cards, and I just laid them all over the floor. And I started moving them around. And I'm like, we're not going to tell this chronologically. I'm a feminist. We don't work chronologically. We work in circles, right? Yeah? So that's what I did. And I told the end of the story first, and then started mixing it up that way. And then, uh, and I just put this in here because I like it. Um, <laughs> but that's what happened, sort of, kind of. Uh, and from those ashes, an even better new thing was made. And now, look at the page count. 113 pages. That, my friends, is a two-hour play, right? So we put this thing on. Here's the poster. You can't see it very well, um, but I love this poster because these are peonies around, and that's one of the metaphors of the story. And this is Grace, and off here she has uh, sort of the scales of justice, right, which is really cool. So a friend of ours here did this. And then this is the end moment of the play, which is quite lovely. And a uh, little quick side note that I do have time for. Um, this is Abby Carter, who is a senior this year. And she came in and auditioned for the role and got cast as Grace Marks as a freshman, which completely bowled us over, right? But she was phenomenal. So it was during this process that I learned a lot about what made the play tick. And I made all kinds of changes. I was sitting there right next to the director. I was scribbling as we went. I actually had a couple of instances where I wrote pages in the rehearsal hall, emailed them to the stage manager. She ran to the office, printed them out, brought them back into rehearsal, and we did them right there. Yeah, That exhilarates me beyond measure. 
right? Because that's what we do, right? We are in real time creating life on a stage, and here we go, right? And these actors, these student actors that we work with here at Ball State are phenomenal, and they were so game. They were so game. They did not complain once, right? What do you mean I got new lines to memorize? No, it was more like, oh, this is great. This scene works awesome, right? Okay. Then what? So after the workshop production at Ball State University, um, we had the opportunity to do the world premiere of the play at Chicago's Rivendell Theater Ensemble. And that was because the artistic director came down to see what we did at Ball State and was blown away. So she contacted Karen, who was connected to the ensemble, and said, what's happening with this? And she said, we don't know. And they said, bring it to Chicago. So here we are, right? So here's the uh, poster that uh, they reprinted after the reviews. And I've never had an experience quite like this, right? when you read about the things that, that happen. And, uh, and these are, uh, a lot of folks in the audience were familiar with the original, right? And the thing I heard over and over again was this is the book. <laughs> this feels like the book. This has the qualities about the book that I love. And yet, in order to get there, the paradox is I had to go all the way over here, right? And think about the story and think about the reasons why we wanted to tell that story, right? It's really hard to see <laughs> because I put it on a purple background. That's Ashley Neal. She was phenomenal as Grace. Um, and uh, this, is, this is Drew Vidal, who's one of our faculty members of theater and dance. He actually uh, got up and got an equity credit for doing this. It was a professional equity production. Um, and then this happened Monday night. So I actually um, won what's called a Joseph Jefferson Award for the adaptation, which is Chicago's Tony. So that was really exciting. So that's, I threw that in there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so talk about being blown away. That was, that was a huge surprise, because I was up against folks from the Goodman Theater, Chicago Shakespeare Theater. I mean, these were the heavy hitters of Chicago theater, and I won the award, so that was really cool. So. After Rivendell Theater Ensemble, which was extended for three weeks because they sold out. And the thing is, guys, we think theater's dying, right? It's not. It's not if we find the stories that really resonate with people. This is what can happen, right? So they extended it for three weeks. Um, next up was a production at Clarence Brown Theater in Knoxville, Tennessee. And this one literally just closed. Uh, and there's the poster, which I just love. Um, hand painted, and then these are some of the photos. Uh, this was an equity production at what we call a League of Regional Theaters theater, um, which are the professional regionals around the country. There are 40 of them, and they're at different levels. Um, Clarence Brown is a Lort D theater, uh, and these are one. This is uh, Brenda Orleana, um, a beautiful, wonderful uh, Latinx woman who. Uh, brought in a ton of, of her own thoughts about her parents' work as a refugee, uh, or not work, but work with refugees. And uh, they had immigrated themselves, and so Grace in the book is an Irish immigrant, and there was just an authenticity to what she did that I didn't even think possible with the historical play. So the production of Clarence Brown was extended for a day, because that's all they could do, but <laughs> it was still pretty cool, because <laughs> their schedule wouldn't allow for anything more. And, uh, and that just uh, closed a couple weeks ago. So right now, Brian and I are exploring um, productions in Canada. There's a theater in Toronto that is interested that is three blocks away from Margaret Atwood's house. Seriously. Uh, we are also in negotiations for the next US production, which I don't want to jinx by telling you where that will be, but it will be someplace exciting. Uh, and then uh, possibly we will publish it uh, through one of the major uh, play publication companies. And I have had a ton of people ask me if they can do it. So I actually have a re request from Notre Dame. I have UC Irvine. I have a lot of universities that are interested in this play. So once we get it published, um, then it becomes available for the, the wide, wide world to do. And will I try an adaptation again? You bet. And I'm, I have also uh, been fortunate enough to be able to take a step into the world of film and television. So I have a couple of uh, projects I'm working on right now that are centered around that. So the best thing about this was, was being able to open my mind to possibilities of, of 
who I am as an artist in conversation with this artist I revere and respect and who I have learned so much from, right? But at the end of the day, it's exactly what she said in her response to me. I've told my story, now you tell yours, right? And so here we are sort of exploring these together in conversation and the play itself is a new thing. We have several characters. I created several characters that aren't in the book. I combined a lot of the book characters into one, right? So it was a really elastic kind of thing. And in doing so, I have gone beyond what I ever thought imaginable, right? So this is why I say dreaming Ms. Atwood, because in dreaming her uh, intentions, I have been able to share in that and create something of my own. Um, so to sum up, Right? Adaptations can be a celebration of the original, and I think the good ones are, right? And there are places for good adaptations in theater and film, and unfortunately there are many, many bad ones. So I think the act of adapting things gets a really bad rap, right? But if we know what we're doing when we go into it, then I think that opens up the space for a whole lot of new possibilities, right? I had to deal with imposter syndrome. Right? This is probably one of the biggest learning experiences I've had in my creative life, is being able to think of myself as an artist that is allowed to interpret Margaret's work. Right? Stories that work in a particular way as they're written can and do resonate differently in other forms, and I know we're almost uh, out of time and we want to do Q&A, but in this instance, uh, when I was driving down to Knoxville to see the production of Alias Grace, as I said at the beginning, you know, it's a story about the truth and it's a story about what happened in the past and, and putting people on the spot and asking them to sift through their memories and try and recreate the events of what happened in the past. So I'm driving down to Knoxville on Thursday during the Kavanaugh hearings. Opening night was Friday night and we, it was sold out and I'm watching this play literally through new eyes because we are in this place right now and the audience responded differently than they did in Chicago because of that, right? So the conversation in the world had changed and accordingly, the work changed, the play changed, the actual living play changed because of that. And so that's another reason to do adaptations, right? And to do them well, but to think about them in the current context where they're being offered. And the process of adaptation, again to reiterate, is not a direct translation, but it's more of an extended conversation, right? Each work is a unique entity that both contributes to and listens to the other. And to finish up, I was sand, I was snow, written on, rewritten, smoothed over. Thank you. We have some time for questions, right? Yeah? Okay, questions? <laughs> Either I was really, really boring. <laughs> or, I don't know, okay. Ah, okay, anybody see the Netflix series? Yeah, yeah, okay. Did you like the Netflix series? You did, yeah? Cool, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Yeah, I really haven't seen it yet because I've been working on the play at the same time. Um, and the other thing I actually forgot to, to kind of mention is how this whole thing came about. But when, when Brian called Margaret's people, um, there are, you can generally purchase film and television rights to adapt, to adapt something, and then the stage rights are separate, right? So the film and television rights to Alias Grace had been snapped up by Jodie Foster, oddly enough, when the book came out in 96. And she sat on them for a while thinking she was going to make a movie and then that never happened, as is often the case. And then Sarah Polly and her company bought them and there were no plans for the stage version to intersect with the miniseries at all, but timing-wise, that's what happened. So we actually opened the show, it ran for two weeks, and then the Netflix series dropped while the show was happening in Chicago. And the Netflix people were totally fine with that. So what has happened 
is that the Netflix series, because of, particularly of Clarence Brown, and I don't you know, have anything to say to, to do this, but it would be interesting to see if there were any sort of upticks in views. But a ton of people uh, came up to me and said, oh, I'm going to go watch it now, right? Or I'm going to go read it now. And that's really cool, right, that people want to experience it in its other forms. Yeah. How many Jeff? episodes is that? It's like six, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a limited series, so it's about. How do you feel about that? You feel like they get, they get all, they get so much more time. Like they didn't really adapt it as much. That's a cheat. You know what? Um, but I get more, um, I get more longevity, right? And and the interesting thing is that in 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 condensing it down to two hours, it is it is much more action driven. I've heard. The series is very introspective, and it's very sort of there. There are a lot of sort of kind of internal moments you can do that in film, and that's that's great. And it's different, you know. I just look at it as something different. Um, but the cool thing is that the play can continue to to be new, right? With every production, it's new. And the series, of course, is is now sort of you know what they call in the can, and you can watch it or not. And in this case, you know, we can kind of keep reinventing as it goes. So that's pretty exciting. So do you direct this one? Yeah. Nope. Nope. Uh, I'm at a point right now where I don't like directing my own plays. I am way more interested in the, the collaboration between the play and the director. And I, I love to, to be a fly on the wall and listen to those conversations. Because a lot of times, things that I never intended come to the fore. and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, that's brilliant, right? Because I was so preoccupied with something else that, that this particular metaphor or moment, right? Absolutely. That's, that's one of the reasons why I do theater, right? Is there's a, the collaborative art of being in a room together with people and making a thing is, is um, exhilarating to me. There's nothing like it, right? So even, even though I am doing some work in, in film and TV right now, I will never stop writing plays because that is, to me, the most fundamental form of, of collaboration we have. Have you, met, have you met her? Have you met her? I've met Margaret twice, but not in the context of this yet, right? She was supposed to come to Chicago, and then she won an award. I can't remember which one. It was, it was a cool one, right? And so the, the day she was supposed to come and see the show, she actually had to go and accept an award. Um, gee. So, <laughs> um, so I missed being able to meet her during that. However, I've met her twice. Once was when I was working at Borders. It was right after Alias Grace came out. And she was in the bookstore, and I went up to her, and I was a fool. Um, <laughs> and then she actually did a, a speaking engagement at uh, my graduate school when I was in, in grad school, and I had a stack of my books. <laughs> I had purchased first editions through Borders, and I had a stack of them, and I brought them in, and she signed them all. So, yeah, I got to chat with her a little bit. And she used to do plays with her brother in, uh, in their barn when she was a kid. Yeah, that came up in her speech, and, of course, I talked to her about it. All right. It's on this floor. Yeah. So you, you said you're going to be doing film and television. Are you doing adaptations or directing? More? Right now, I have two projects that are that are in process. One is an original, um, but it's ba it's a it's a series that's based on an, a real person, um, uh, Mariah Mitchell, who was the first uh, female astronomer in the U.S. Uh, and taught at Vassar College. So it's kind of a riff on her life. And uh, then, but I am doing. Um, uh, and I, I've actually been asked to submit some treatments for different adaptations that didn't wind up moving forward. Um, but there's something I'm working on now, which is sort of a combination adaptation of a book, but also adding in different material um, about the uh, nuns who worked on, who did missionary work during the Civil War in El Salvador. And yes, I have met with our provost, who's not here anymore. But <laughs> we've already started talking about that. Tell us about Jill's Ah, coming up in uh, the spring semester, Ball State is doing, much, much as they did Alias Grace, we're doing a production of Borrowed Babies, which is a collaboration with Jill Christman, 
who is a phenomenal professor in our Department of English, and she's she writes, uh, writes and teaches creative nonfiction, as uh, among other things. And uh, I, I told her after I read her book, which came out five, six years ago, five years ago, uh, and it's, it's a short book that you can buy online for three bucks, and please do, because it's beautiful. And I, I read it, and it's about her journey as a writer and a researcher to find stories of these uh, orphans that were actually raised in home management houses at universities. And that was a thing that happened, started in the 20s and really stopped in, in the 70s. And uh, we actually had a baby program here at Ball State in our home management house. That was something we found out together, which was really exciting. Um, but she went to Ithaca and couldn't find a whole lot of information uh, about the program, or she couldn't find any of the, the babies as adults. But what she did was she wrote this gorgeous meditation on motherhood, because she was pregnant while she was doing this research. So the book is about what does it mean to be a mother, what does it mean to you know, raise children, a and then she sort of flashes back to the facts of the baby programs, and then sort of to her own feelings about the research. So anyway, I read this book and I fell in love, and I had lunch with her, and I said, I want to uh, uh, work with your book. And the cool thing is that this, the, the play is a work of fiction, right? It is inspired by the work that Jill did. But essentially, the two of us together said, all right, so what if you would have found one of these, these folks? You know, what would, what would happen when that person, that woman in this case, uh, finds out the truth about her life, you know, for the first two years of her life? and that she actually had 14 mothers <laughs> during the first two years of her life. Uh, so that's what we did. So that's what this play is. And um, done a couple readings of it, and we're, uh, we're doing the very first production in the spring. So please come check it out. OK, awesome. Well, now it's time for Joe. So thank you all very much.